Amir from DPG. The talk is scaling recommender systems. Um, I hope it's generic enough to translate to any sort of machine learning application. Um, maybe before I start, I'll introduce myself a bit more. Uh, I have a background in engineering. Um, I did some academic research. I worked in a startup. I joined Medialam, the VTM for all the Flemish people, <laughs> in 2016 as a data scientist. Um, before I joined Medialan, I was already in the field of personalization and recommender systems. It's always been a bit of my uh, passion slash hobby project. Um, in 2018, within DPG, within Medialan back then, I started working on video personalization. And since the, the end of last year, I worked for all of recommendation research for DPG in both the Belgian and Belgian Netherlands. We have a lot of brands that you can see. I think if you're Flemish or Dutch native, some of these are familiar to you. Um, what's my goal for today? I'll share with you how we went from an old school video solution to something that's totally personalized and how we're translating this to different media products. I'll try to focus on technical and non-technical stuff. I'll also try to leave enough questions so you can take it wherever you want to take it. Um, I'll start with the VTM Go example. VTM Go is, a, yeah, of course, the video solution from VTM, the biggest Flemish TV broadcaster. Um, if you look at the product like it is, let's call it like it is. It looks like Netflix. It's a copy paste of something like Netflix. Netflix is the blueprint of what is a modern video solution. Um, so I think it's a very successful product that by now is available on all devices. When we launched this in 2019, um, it was just a little bit of personalization. The Ambe Vola was a typical marketing sticker feature that every product guy wanted without knowing anything what it means to be personalized or what machine learning is or, or data. It's just something that a marketeer wants, it's personalized. So that's how we started in 2019, very simple. I'm happy to say that actually today the product is fully personalized and like short of Netflix, there's not a lot of other solutions in the market that have it to this extent. Of course, on a technical level, we have to be modest and pragmatic, but on a functional user level, Every user gets their entirely unique front page. If you log in with different accounts at the same amount at the same moment, you will see it's a totally different product, except maybe a single curated message. But the main experience is actually fully personalized. So in this extent, it's what you would have with if you compare your Netflix to your friends' Netflix. It's a different product. So how do we make this work? I'll start with something I don't think I've ever done: some interactivity. Um, what are the cliche things in an IT project and why does it typically fail or not work? Does anyone want to shout something? Don't be shy. I've never done this for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, so these are some of the cliches, right? If you Google it, everyone who's worked in technology is familiar with all of these things, right? Um, think about poor defined scope, goals, just your typical unclarity or a lack of expertise. These are the typical things that make an IT project go wrong and why it's always complicated stuff. It doesn't matter if you're doing the back end of a finance system or something else, it's always complicated. So what does that mean when we look at data machine learning projects? As far as I would say, it's the same, but just worse. The dragon just became a multi-headed dragon, but in the foundations, the same problems, they are just much more complicated. Why? For example, if you think about something like data quality, that's essential for anything. We've heard it before as well. There's enough um, speeches like garbage in, garbage out, these type of things, it's true. But it's something that's easy to say and, and hard to fix. Data platforms and stuff like this can be at the base of a solution, but even then, things like governance and, and things beyond that, it's always very tricky to fix this, right? So that's one of the first things that's a key success factor. And if you're just dropped in into a company to fix an ML solution, you don't control it, right? But it's very hard and it's essential to your success. Also, when you talk about output and goals, deliverable, it's often tricky. When I make you an app and you tell me when the button gets clicked, show me a dialogue, that's very clear. But once you talk about what's a good recommendation, what's a good prediction, when is it good enough, in which use case, it often open, opens up a kind of, kind of worms. So right away, you start with a communication issue and with a not speaking the, the, the same language. But also here, any scientist will tell you, I need a metric, I need an objective. I need to know what, what type of data and information I have to work with. I need to know what you expect from my predictions. And then the, the final one, we have to say it as it is, it's still a very young field. Even if the cloud has been around for 16 years, and a lot of these statistics that dates back to the 70s and the 80s, it's still a young field. 
So this means that both in the engineering side and in the business side, we, we still are dealing with a low level of what I would call education, a low level of experience, right? I have done this for eight years now. I have a few successful projects. Wouldn't call myself super experienced, but that's where the field is right now. Uh, so what, what do I believe, and this is my very biased and personal opinion based on the experience I have, what, what is the solution? It's pragmatism, and the reason I put it threefold is it's not an error. I believe you can put it in a few different axes, um, what I call functional, technical, and operational, and just be, being pragmatic in all of these fields gets you a long way to tackle with all the complexity, because the main challenge is just dealing with all the complexity. So maybe, Important here to understand, as I've shown you with VTM Go, we started with just Amo Volavaria. Will you give me the five minutes warning, please? Okay. Will yeah. you give me five minutes? Um, we started with just Amo Volavaria, and um, the main reason we did that was just because we needed to get some stakeholder interaction as well, some stakeholder experience. When I joined the company in 2016, the company wasn't convinced that we needed something like Netflix, they thought TV is not entirely the same. Do we even need this, right? So the business wasn't even fully on board, like do we need a solution? If you then consider what type of technical complexity comes with this solution, you see we have a problem, right? So you have to be aware of your internal maturity levels in this regard. The first thing you need to know is, okay, what is a digital product? How do we evaluate it? Are we just happy with visitors on our website? Are we measuring the amount of minutes you're watching video? These are the things that your organization needs to have experience with right and if you're a subscriber business it can be easy the number of subscribers is the, the starting metric but everything before that is how how do you control it <clears throat> um so that's really important because the worst case thing that can happen is something like an innovation manager says okay let's personalize this thing because they want the sticker and it was the case for us the initial traction was a marketeer who felt we need to personalize it customers like this we need a sticker but that's not a good path to, to a viable product so you need to make sure that you have everything that you need in terms of understanding what you want as well. And also, if the stakeholder in buying, there's no point in selling it. Because what I wanted to do was fully personalize it right away. Let's just do this, but there is no attraction, so you have to educate and find a safe way to, to get going. Mm. And so yeah, that's the main thing. That also, when you design it MVP, you have to think about the roadmap and, and the, the way you do it. Um, in 2016, it was too early for an MVP for us. So we spent a year and a half working on data pipelines, just getting reporting and insights. What are the customers doing on the product? What do they care about? Which functionality is being used? This is your basic analytics experience, right? And that's the first starting point. Once you have that, then you have to look at your capabilities. If you have a bit of understanding on what the metrics are, can we move the product forward? And based on that, you decide what's a sensible way to personalize. And that's how we came to, okay, let's just get a fully static curated product, but have some ML in there. If you look at the product point of view, it allows you to learn, okay, what's the impact of personalization on the customer, but also technically. If that thing fails, there's no impact on the product. It's a small added feature, so you have a lot of affordability in the engineering space as well. You, you have a safe space to try this, and you have a good way to let your engineers grow into this as well to assess your, your whole platform. Um, and the reason also why I say that too early for an MVP, another anecdote I have on this is in the past year I've consulted with a few startups and one of them actually came to me, I've tried personalization, it's not working, it's not working. We tried it, was personalized, is that just not the right technology or why is this not working? But then you start talking about the product and what they were personalizing and then it was a typical example, okay, a bunch of engineers who were very excited about exciting technology, they throw the algorithm in there and none of the metrics were moving. But then you look at the place in the product they were trying it and the fact that there wasn't even a title above the box telling the customer what to expect. I told them, have you looked at the engagement metrics of this box? Have you looked at how people are using this and what type of your customers are using this? And then we came to the point that they only had a single dashboard that just showed page views and sessions. That's all they knew about the customers. I told them, your problem is not with AWS Personalize. Your problem is with getting really a grip of how are your customers using your platform. And that's actually the transition then to the second field of pragmatism that you need, technical pragmatism. Because as I told you in the introduction, I'm an engineer myself. I love myself some geeky challenges and some technical challenges, but that's not what you need to solve the problem I've just shown you. If you look at what we've built, the core of our system dates from the 90s. 
I would dare to say we're one of the most innovative personalized video applications and it's built on technology from the 90s. It works. But a lot of the engineers really say meh at this because this is not the cool stuff. This is not your deep learning approach to solving this. But it's good enough for the problem we're solving. If you look at VTM Go, we have to find the five shows you like out of a set of 500. That's not the same thing as finding 30 songs in a 1 million song library, for example. So it's important that you channel your engineer and that they understand what the actual problem is they're solving. <clears throat> um, and so the path we found, um, yeah, I mixed them, but this is actually one I had to show. So it's not about the, the technology you're using. Um, what we do to this day, a big part of the backend is simple collaborative filtering, simple matrix decomposition. This is Chinese if you're not in the field of recommendation, but let me tell you, this is the most basic stuff. There's a dozen blog posts out there how to develop this in a day. Yet most companies don't get this out. While well, it's making a huge company for us, a, a, a huge difference for us. And then, like for example, I think two years ago I was talking at the meetup in Leuven. You organized that as well. How do you deal with the cold start problem? At that point, I told you I think we don't. It took us two years to solve these type of problems. But these are the type of problems an engineer loves to solve. But in the practice, it had very little solution uh, impact on the solution we end up delivering. And that's very important in all this to really understand which problem are we really solving. Um, and the domain, is, the domain expertise is key there because cold start isn't an issue if you only have five new shows a month, for example, and if all of them get pushed on national TV and all of the media. We can bury this as deep in the product as we want and to find enough customers to get us all the data we need. Of course, we do smarter things than that, but you don't need super smart technology to solve this. But I also wanted to say on this, the reason we found this path is also, again, because of pragmatism, as I told you, we started with working on data engineering insights a lot of etl stuff and at that point we were also already collaborating with data minded i think you've seen us grown from very hacky etl stuff to what is now something that's probably or orchestrated um but it meant that the, most of the people in my team working on this we understood the type of data we were capturing we understood the quality of it and we had control of it this meant that we did control what we have to work with good behavioral data which made it quite easy to look to a simple machine learning solution and that brings me on to the third type of pragmatism, what I would call the operational pragmatism. <clears throat> you have to make sure that you can be agile because there's a lot of uncertainties and you're, you're working in an immature field. Um, so you have to adapt to your organization. <coughs> we were working with a lot of behavioral data, which we know to be good because we had our fair share of data quality issues. We tackled all of that. We also knew that the TV business is struggling with very terrible metadata. It's inconsistent. So you can put 10 marketeers in a room and ask them to label 10 TV shows. They'll meet for three hours and there will not be consensus. Is it comedy? Is it something related? Is it reality? Is it feel? They can go endless. So if you have them feed that data into a model, that's garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> that is really noise. So but because we knew that the behavioral data was correct, because that's how we measure the consumption and that's how we quantify the value of our customers, that was just a good first place to start. <clears throat> Then if you look at the very practical side, and this ties into what I heard from the, the state of data presentation as well from uh, Nathan, how, what, what that also means for us is our team was a mix of machine learning engineer, analysts, and even DevOps. We were our own independent team building our own little platform very independently. It means we could minimize upstream or downstream dependencies because in a big company, you always have these. In some extent, you could have called a shadow IT. <laughs> But it sort of meant in this organization, it allowed us to be agile. It also meant that if it went down, it was our as on the line and not some ops team across the wall. And this also is a good way to incentivize your engineers to be pragmatic with what they, what they design as well. Because if the engineer knows he will get called, then maybe a simple static pipeline is better than a fancy online model. <clears throat> and that's one of the main conclusions here to getting this done. Avoid the science, avoiding the science and engineering rabbit holes because a lot of the very capable people, and there are a lot of capable people out there, they're intrigued by the technical, technical challenges. And that's often not what you need to solve the business problem. So I think when you build out a product and a team, you need to find a way to incentivize these people, give them the, the fun problems to work on while making sure that they don't get lost four weeks, six weeks into solutions that have marginal contributions. One thing that I want to highlight, the shape-up method, some of you may notice, it's quite old, but it's got a kind of buried in the whole Agile hype. It's from a base camp. It's a bit like Jira Confluence, but also older. 
But what I like about the Shape Up method, it talks about concepts like appetite. It's a bit like, what's your budget for a project? And maybe it's only two weeks of work, but it's, it's something that you value. You can put six weeks of investments in it. And working like this, this allows you to give your team some freedom as well. And this allows you to give you some incentives to the technical people to work on challenges sometimes. Even if the value isn't that big, you can have a, an appetite for it. And then in this field, especially the, the luck we have, we focused on being able to A-B test fast. And that's the easiest way for our, for our teams to generate value. We're always doing A-B tests. And as soon as those are up and running, we can do something else. And this thing is gathering data, proving a point or, or disproving a point. That's business value that's being generated. And while that's happening, we're doing other stuff. That, that thing is running online, it's collecting its data. We're waiting two weeks, four weeks. But this also gives us a lot of freedom to work on the next thing and basically gives you a lot of flexibility work to work on those more technical challenges. <clears throat> the last one that I want to mention is what I said as well, avoid sticker features, right? Because one of the first things that I was asked at the beginning of it go is, okay, let's personalize it, but also let's make sure we can manage it all and overrule left and right. You don't need to understand this question to understand it's going to double, quadruple the complexity. We want to add a lot of engineering around it. Even to this day, the system that powers the VETM Go, a marketer can either have a personalized item or a curated. There's no in between. We've built zero buttons. Commercial vendors do this. We are a small team, which we don't give them the buttons. Either we make sure the personalization is what they want and it's according to their business or they can overrule, but there's no in between. We have spent zero hours working on things like this, which means we're working on the things that make the model better. <clears throat> now, this is a lot about VTM Go, but as you've seen, we've been there for a while. For the past year, we've also been working hard to bring this into uh, different domains, like news, for example. Today, we're actually live on Noodle.nl, which is the biggest news site in the Netherlands, also on hln.be, we're live with a lot of stuff. And you've just heard me talk about being pragmatic and locally optimized, so how do we scale it? And that's been an interesting experience as well. Um, if you look at how we handle a product stakeholder and how we decide scope, that's exactly the same. You have to educate your stakeholder and make sure you can be pragmatic. <clears throat> so nothing changes there. But on the engineering level, a lot of things start to change, right? You have to, you don't want to have three independent technical solutions. You have to find some levels of synergy. Where do you find the common denominators? And there the answer is basically the platform. What Nathan said as well, we started with a platform close to the team. And this was not supposed to be animated, my excuses. It used to be that every team had their own SRE expert in their own tiny platform. Now they all have a shared platform. So we started with a platform super close to the team. Now we're moving a bit further away from the team. We have three independent teams working on video personalization, news personalization, and search. And they all shared at first a simple op solution. But actually that op solution is a bit the, how you say it is, the tension between pragmatism and scale because now we have to scale that, so you are a bit less pragmatic, but it's working quite well, and why? Because it's just an enabler. Not a single de developer loves an ops issue, so that's why if you're handling ops, you have the buy-in. You're right away, you're taking pain away, and so from that starting point, you can make the role of the platform bigger, as long as you keep taking pain away from your functional developers, and that's exactly what we're doing. It used to be things like deploying CI, CD, now it's DevOps, Next year, the pain of making sure a model runs online, because now we are doing this, will be handled by a platform team. And this also means that the people in the product teams can build more expertise on the products they're working on and the, the, the product-specific optimizations. And all the real technical details are handled in a platform team. <clears throat> How am I doing on time, Chris? You're still good. Still good. Oh, okay. But leave five minutes for questions. All right, so <laughs> I'm almost done. So if you look at, I've just shown you, we have the, the product teams, they each have their own focus. They understand what's a video product, what's a news product, and how do we tackle search? And so what we're evolving towards is we're a team where all the big machine learning problems are solved once. We have a system that gets patterns from behavioral data. We have a system that gets patterns from textual data. We can tie all that together to sort of calculate your taste. And then below that is a layer where we do it product specific. So this means we have a focus team video and they have a single video solution, but they can still scale it to fit and go, streams, HLM video, they can scale it like that. We have the focus team news. Also there, they can scale it HLM and new, and they get different type of recommendations. The algorithms are the same, the principles are the same, but we can optimize for each product 
it's a necessity because also the data patterns are different. If you want to do a good trending prediction, streams, FATM, Go, HLN, it's different magnitudes even of consumed data. So you want to tweak the aggressiveness of your trending, for example. Um, I think then I'm about ready to wrap it all up. Um, so what have I said today to you? For me, the, 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 the rules are the same as for any IT technology product. It's just, it's all more complicated. It comes at a higher cost. Um, where a typical engineer can have a debate about the right program language, now we can get really off into the weeds about what's a good way to do A-B tests, right? A very ops problem. These are the type of things where you want to apply the pragmatism. For the first two years, we were able to do only very simple A-B tests. Today, we can do canary deployments and say, two users get this, five users get that. We got three years out without solving any of these issues. So the first pragmatic thing I wanted to emphasize again is assess your surroundings, because you have to understand the company you're in, the product you're in, and, and all your stakeholders, both in business and IT. Is there a data platform? Do you have an educated stakeholder? And what does that mean for the scope of your work? Then this is a really important one. There's really no shame in starting really small. Our initial MVP for Vitem Go was developed three or four months. Six months in, we just did a home, a 100% refactor. If you keep it this small, the error of starting over is also really small. Just ship it, and a few months in, you can just start over. But because you keep it so lightweight, it's easy to do. If you start with a lot more fe uh, features and functionality to start, the cost of getting it wrong goes up significantly. So you want to keep it really sizable as well. And then know that it's all going to be very uncertain, both on the stakeholder side and on the technical side, and prepare yourself for it. And you can do that in the staffing. With our small team, we had our own ops guy to deal with all the technical stuff. With the stack, choose reliable technology, modern technology, but don't try the state of the art stuff if you don't need it. And with the roadmap, make sure you can incentivize your technical people that technical challenges are also there, but that you also have the story for your stakeholder that value is coming as well. And then I think Nathan also said this a little bit, you have to move the platform away a bit further at some point and how far. I also don't have rules on that and on any of this actually, so. These principles, they work for so long and then you have to abandon them anyway. But I hope this helps you get started. Yeah. Um, so there were a few questions on um, uh, Menti. So the, the first one is streams reusing the VTM Go personalization algorithm. Yeah, the app is identical. Right? It's, 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 uh, you can see it's a sort of white-labeled solution, so it's different branding and different data in, but it's the same thing, so also the algorithms are the same. They are configured a bit differently, but technically it's all the same. All right, that was easy. Um, next, uh, a typical problem with recommendations is to re realize that multiple users could be using the same device while they have different tastes. How do you handle that? Good question. Depends on the product. Um, for Vitem Go, because it's a free account, this doesn't happen very often. It really doesn't. A lot of people have their own account, um, so we don't really solve it for Vitem Go. <clears throat> but for example, if you look at the HLN, the news app, there currently the algorithm doesn't personalize on the logged in user. It personalizes on the device, if we have the opt-ins, obviously. But so if you authorize personalization, even if you're logged in, we will not look at your logged in behavior, but only on that device, because we see that we get enough data for a qualitative recommendation. And then we avoid this problem altogether, because if you're sharing accounts, it's usually not the same device. The, the, the kid has the iPad, then the, the mother has the laptop. And just by using this, they get the experience they want in the product. And you solve this. And this is a very good example, because a lot of the scientists in my team want to solve this with a nice model, and I'm sure we can. But just this type of pragmatism means we've solved it for all of users and zero engineering was involved. Cool. Um, all right, what is a cold start problem? I wondered about that as well, actually. <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course. Um, in the problem of, of recommending content to a user, the cold start problem is what do you do if a new item to recommend to someone appears and you don't know what something about it? So imagine I want to recommend you a TV show and I told you I use behavioral data, but this TV show is appearing right now Nobody's seen it, so my model knows nothing about it. Nothing about the show, so I cannot make any good recommendations. That's a cold start problem. There's many ways to solve this. You can randomly sample this item to some people to get some data. But as I mentioned with VTM Go, all the new stuff that gets launched on VTM Go, 
even if it's buried because there's so much media attention around everything that's launched there, even if it's buried, 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 it will find 100 users. And that's all we need to fix that cold start problem. In practice, we've done some smart product hacks as well to solve it a bit better. But because of all of the way the media works there, it's solved by itself. On streams, we actually have a few different solutions. I can go into that, but maybe that's for yeah. a specialized <laughs> audience. But we do have some solutions. But the cold start problem is just how do you recommend an item that you know nothing about? How, or how do you make a recommendation to a user that you know nothing about? All right, cool. Um, so, Mark, <coughs> organizations often struggle with getting test data and test environments that are misaligned with operational products. How do you deal with this? And does it work? Um, depends exactly, of course, on the type of problem you're solving. We're not doing health predictions, so the cost of getting it wrong is different than if you're in the, in the, the health tech right now. So don't take my question as a guidance if you're in health, for example. Um, the initial proof of concepts, we do all offline, right? And we can do this with quality validation. Imagine we want to see if an algorithm makes sense based on behavioral data. Yeah. If I'm outputting a super action movie next to a Christmas movie, I can test this offline based after it in an algorithm. Okay, give me the matrix I think was your reference. Give me movies like the matrix. If I get rom-coms, I only need one domain expert and I don't even need a domain expert to tell me that's not a good model. So the first assessment we can do is just offline qualitative like this because it's in the product space it's allowed. The next thing we do then, once we know that that's good enough, we already go online. And at, at launch of it, I'm going to be making it in mind, we went online for at least 10%, 20% of the users. Now we can do it very gradual. So if you have a tweak in the algorithm and we're not entirely sure, we can really say only 10 internal people, only 1%, and then gradually roll out. So we have a test environment, but only for technical tests. As soon as you look at evaluation of the algorithms, it's all in production. All right. Um, Which I like, by the way. For, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip the remaining questions. Um, thanks again, uh, Marta, for giving this amazing speech. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you